quick announcement on the Wirewheel side. We're, we're very excited to announce that we've just launched our new universal pre uh, preference and consent platform. It's now generally available. Um, and our new platform is really addressing those critical needs, um, you know, specifically around some of the new laws in the United States and, and globally. And we're really you know, looking forward to, to working with companies, um, you know, helping really solve for some of the new requirements around the country, especially around the, the, uh, the Sephora enforcement decision in California. Great to see everybody. Again, we have a phenomenal uh, audience uh, of attendees and that's been the case all day today. So I, I just, I wanna thank the Spokes community for turning out as you have. And uh, we have a fantastic panel today uh, to talk about the new EU US data privacy framework. I'm still getting used to the name, everybody. Uh, I'm going to take a moment and I'm going to go around and uh, let everybody introduce themselves, talk about your practice and, and areas where you focus. Um, I'll start, if you don't mind, with Shannon Yavorsky, who's been a practitioner in the area of privacy and data protection. I won't say how long, Shannon. I won't say how long for anybody. I've got too much gray hair to talk about years at this point, but Shannon's joining us from Oric. Uh, Shannon, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, thanks so much, Justin, and thanks for having me today on this uh, pretty amazing panel. Uh, I'm the global chair of Oric Cyber Privacy and Data Innovation Practice. I'm an English solicitor, so I practiced in London for about 12 years before moving to the US uh, eight years ago. And I've been advising companies on really practical aspects of cross-border data transfer for about 20 years. Um, and it's been a roller coaster between Safe Harbor, um, you know, Shrems One, and then Privacy Shield, and now the DPF, which I'm also getting used to the name of, uh, of it. Um, but I, it's, never, it's never a dull moment. It's a really interesting working on all aspects of cross-border data transfer and advising companies that are struggling with this issue on a day-to-day -day basis. Terrific. Uh, thank you for joining us here, uh, Shannon. Um, I'm just gonna go in order that I see you around my screen, which may not be the same as you see on your side. I'm gonna turn it next to Alex Joel, uh, who's joining us from American University, Washington College of Law, and formerly of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, where Alex played a very important role um, on the civil liberties side. So Alex, may I turn it over to you for an intro? I think you just introduced me, Justin. That's great. Yeah, so uh, the program that I'm running right now at, at uh, the law school is uh, called Privacy Cross Borders, so focusing on national security and cross-border data flows. And as you pointed out, I was at the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. I was there for 14 years as the Civil Liberties Protection Officer, which is uh, featured in the new executive order. And before that, I was at the CIA. And before that, I was in the private sector. And I started off in Army JAG. So, um, and as you know, Justin, you know, I was working with you. And, and of course, Peter was very much involved as well when we were talking about uh, the response to the Snowden disclosures and then the uh, privacy shield discussions back in the day. Alex, obviously great to see you again, and thank you for joining. A lot of important items we're going to be covering today. Um, I'm going to go over to Travis LeBlanc. Travis is not only a partner and a senior leader at Cooley, but he also serves as a member of the Privacy Civil Liberties Oversight Board, P Club. Uh, Travis, thank you for joining us today. Do you mind giving him thank a moment? You. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Justin. Great to see you. Peter, Alex, and Shannon, and looking forward to today's conversation. I, as Justin said, I am a um, member of the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. We'll probably talk about that a little while um, uh, later in the session, and so I won't give much detail on that. Um, uh, in addition to that, I'm also a partner at Cooley, where I'm on the litigation department leadership team and also um, one of the leaders of our cyber data privacy practice at Cooley, where my practice looks very similar uh, to Shannon's, although um, I also do a lot of, 
of state, uh, in particular, California uh, work as well, given my prior experience in the California Attorney General's office um, under then AG Kamala Harris, where I created the privacy unit and the, uh, the high tech crime unit in California, was also the chief of enforcement um, at the Federal Communications Commission and worked at the U.S. Department of Justice uh, before that. Um, and I'm also uh, was appointed as one of the arbitrators under Privacy Shield, um, the prior framework. And to be fair to Shannon and Justin, uh, the name of the most recent framework has actually changed uh, over the course of the year. And so it's entirely understandable that the current name is one that and current acronym might be a little bit confusing. Yeah, perfect. I appreciate it, Travis. Uh, but great to see you. And thank you for joining us again, uh, each of you. Now, of course, not uh, last but not least, Peter Swire. Uh, Peter has, has uh, I want to call you the elder statesman. Is that all right? Or I, I guess statesman, I have to embrace or, it, Justin. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> has, been, has been involved on these issues um, for several administrations. I'll try to layer this in, Peter. Uh, was involved in the original safe harbor negotiations. Yeah. Served as a witness on uh, on some of these cases. So, uh, Peter, do you mind introducing? Sure. I'll, uh, I, I I will not go through every year of my life, which apparently has gotten quite long. Um, um, I'm Peter Swire. I'm a professor at Georgia Tech. I'm senior counsel with the law firm of Alston and Bird, where I work on cross border issues. Uh, these days, I lead the cross border data forum, and we have a mailing list where we publish a couple items a month uh, uh, about uh, these issues, sort of scholarly uh, policy documents, public policy documents. Um, I, I wrote a book on Brookings for Brookings in 1998 on this emerging issue of EU US data flows. It was called None of Your Business. Apparently that's a good title, but the people who use it most often today don't tend to cite it. Um, and um, and Have I you did consider a lawsuit, Peter, on that. Uh, on yeah, that. I, I I communicated with the leader of the group, and he didn't show any interest in recognizing that. Um, anyway, <laughs> I've been working on these issues for for quite a long time, and and um, the the testimony in the Schrems two trial in Ireland is more than three hundred pages explaining how the how the U.S. intelligence community operates uh, in detail and has oversight and safeguard mechanisms as they existed as of 2016. And so that's still a resource that people might look to. So sign up for the cross-border data forum mailing list if you wanna keep track on these issues. We have an international set of people writing for us. Thanks. Well, terrific. Um, listen, we have a, a, a lot to cover and luckily we had just had the lead negotiators for the US and um, European Commission cover a number of very important topics um, for us a short time ago. As always, it's hard, you know, we've all been in a governmental and non-governmental position. There's only so many things you can cover and they did a fantastic job kind of covering a number of topics today. Um, Peter, I know I'm gonna to turn to you first and then I'm gonna cover a number of other subjects. I know there was a release today from uh, the intelligence community that may be relevant here. Could I turn to you to just talk about that for a moment before we cover some other subjects? Just briefly, the embargo lifted within the last hour. Uh, it's a new document called Intelligence Community Directive 126, ICD 126. The title of it is Implementation Procedures for the Signals Intelligence Redress Mechanism under Executive Order 14086. So this is the Director of National Intelligence setting forth procedures for the intelligence community about how to build the redress mechanism. It's a companion piece to the Department of Justice regulation that was issued on October 7th with the executive order. It, it moves, it's a significant step towards implementing the executive order. In many ways, it, it says things that were in the executive order, but in more detail. It does not say who the qualifying countries are going to be, uh, uh, but it does show how the redress procedure will work in detail. Is there is there a link to that site, Peter, that you can- um, it's on the, So the press release went up on the office of, I'll put it into chat. The, and I think the press release is up, but the full document was not up when this call started. Okay, terrific. Well, thank you for uh, for calling that to everybody's attention. Um, and I'm sure we'll be processing a fair amount. Um, we covered a lot on the morning session and uh, Travis, I'm gonna turn to you here in a moment to start our discussion, if you wouldn't mind, because obviously you serve on the P Club and there's a there's a significant role and an increase of the role for the P Club. Uh, well, one could call it an increase 
in terms of uh, the new framework. Um, one thing I want to note, just so that everybody doesn't have to say it, um, the, pan the views of the panelists today are their own. They're not speaking on behalf of any government agency. And um, Travis, if I miss something because you're appearing in a, in a governmental role as well, uh, please feel free to supplement. Um, I'd say two thirds of the discussion today was around, this morning was around the new executive order, how closely it meets the requirements of um, the high court's decision in Europe, uh, whether it's gonna be meaningful um, and, um, you know, is it gonna be defensible when, it, when you come up under those roles? I won't ask you to cover all of those, uh, Travis, but if I could start with something just so that everybody can hear, what is the P-Club's role on some of these items? How do you describe what's been going on and perhaps cover some of the work you all have been doing you know, on these subjects uh, to kick us off? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to kick us off. And the only other caveat that I would add to the ones that you listed, um, Justin, is, is this is an unclassified conversation. Nothing I say should be, uh, will rely upon anything classified at all. Uh, for purposes of this conversation. Um, the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board, the PCLOB, uh, was created out of a recommendation of the 9-11 uh, Commission uh, report. Uh, the mission of the board um, is to ensure that the um, activities of the United States government to protect us against terrorism are balanced with privacy and civil liberties. Uh, the board has five board members, um, that are presidentially appointed, Senate confirmed, um, that lead the agency. Um, the chair uh, currently is Sharon Bradford Franklin, formerly of CDT, formerly uh, the uh, executive director of the PCLOB uh, during the Obama administration. Uh, and there are also four, um, the chair is full-time. There are four part-time board members. Um, I'm one of the, the part-time board members. This is my uh, second term on the board. Um, we typically uh, provide advice and oversight on the um, in programs and activities of the United States government to protect the nation from terrorism. Um, in an advice function, uh, that's often where an agency will come to us and will say, we're planning to do something, or we're, you know, we're just planning to update procedures or a new activity or program. Can you give us your um, your advice on what privacy and civil liberties protections we should build into the program. Um, we also do oversight projects where we ourselves choose a particular activity uh, or program to conduct an oversight investigation, which usually, although not always, results in a report. Um, one of the most famous reports that we have done has been on section uh, 702 of the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act in 2014. Um, for those uh, who aren't familiar with Section 702, um, it was a new law uh, provision. Uh, it's new provision that was adopted post September 11th. And at a very high level, it authorizes the United States government to target or collect the communications of individuals who are reasonably believed to be outside of the United States. That is a very high overview. But fortunately, the PCLOB wrote a report on it in 2014 that gives you more than 100 pages on it if you would like to read more about what's out there right now. It's been relied upon um, in, I think, all of the SHRIMS decisions by the CJEU in understanding Section 702 and is fundamentally one of the key programs um, that the intelligence community uses in the United States that has caught the attention of, of the CJEU and uh, the European Data Protection Authorities. By way of background, Section 702 is, is set to expire or sunset in 2023, so at the end of next year, which, uh, which means that uh, Congress is highly likely in the coming year to take up consideration about whether to reauthorize Section 702. And so that will be very public in 2023. And I'm sure that um, our, 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 our friends uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, we'll pick to what Congress does there. In anticipation of Congress's consideration of whether to extend um, Section 702, we at the PCLOB are working on an updated report 
uh, that we anticipate releasing next year. Um, we're also uh, planning to host a public forum in, uh, it'll be a virtual public forum in January, I believe it's January 12th, uh, on Section 702, where we will have several representatives from government, uh, from, uh, from the, the nonprofit team that are all participating um, on, uh, on that forum, and we will detail those and make those public um, in, the, in the coming weeks. In addition to working on Section 702, we're busy working on domestic terrorism um, and uh, looking at um, the privacy and civil liberties implications of the of the, the the efforts that have been taken by the U.S. government uh, to counter uh, domestic terrorist threats. Um, we anticipate that we would do a report on that. Uh, we're also mandated by Congress, actually, in a recent uh, law, uh, we call it the Section 824, to produce a report on the, let me clarify, the Director of National Intelligence is supposed to prepare a report on um, the efforts made by international actors to promote domestic terrorism in the United States or to promote terrorist activity by domestic individuals in the United States. We are supposed to review that report when it comes out um, and to report to Congress on that. That should be coming out. Hopefully, it was supposed to be 180 days, I believe. We're, we're coming up on that deadline, so that should be should be soon. And we're also, uh, one other uh, area that we're working on that might be relevant to this group is we're looking, we're working on an FBI open source project where we're looking at the, the Bureau's acquisition of commercially available information and its use of open source data um, and its activities and uh, obviously, you know, balancing those with privacy and civil liberties. With respect to the EU-US data privacy framework, uh, the executive order does um, encourage or task the, uh, the PCLOB with several responsibilities uh, in connection with, uh, with, with the framework. First, uh, we are encouraged to approve the implementing policies and procedures that the components of the intelligence community will um, will uh, promulgate or adopt or release um, following the executive order. Peter just a little while ago highlighted uh, the ODNI procedures, or you know they may be coming. Um, we are asked to review them after they're released and to provide our feedback on them. So that's one role that we have. We are also right now. Uh, we've actually done this already. Um, recommending judicial candidates. Uh, to the Attorney General for the Data Protection Review Court, um, you know, where uh, I, I believe uh, the AG is currently considering those recommendations for who will be appointed to that court. He also is taking recommendations from the Department of Commerce uh, and from the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Um, lastly, we are tasked with annually reviewing um, the implementation and compliance with the executive order, including uh, looking and reviewing any um, civil liberties and privacy officer or uh, data protection review court decisions and making sure that those are complied with. This is, you know, while this is a new role for us, we did regularly participate in the annual reviews of Privacy Shield. So when the Europeans and the U.S. officials would get together, the PCLOB would also participate in those. And so in many ways, this is a continued function there, but it's a responsibility that we will be taking on to review this annually and to report, uh, you know, any concerns that uh, that we may we may have. Travis, I mean, there, there, what what you've covered is a tremendous amount of work and a lot going on that just folks do not realize. I know that I know the European Commission knows it, and I know you participate in a lot of interagency, intra-agency, and international discussions of it. But I don't think the community fully appreciates how much independent review is going on by the P, P Club, if I may. And I'm going to bring this into the context of what we just heard from um, the lead negotiators. By the way, one thing I will say, if folks do have questions, please post them to the Q&A and our panelists will try to take these here in the next few minutes. One of our participants has posted the link to the um, the um, site, I believe, that um, that Peter talked about, and I'll put it up just so that folks can have it as we go. There's at least the link to the executive order site, um, which we appreciate you posting. Um, 
But let me, you know, the 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 team that was speaking in the last panel, you know, they're they're very very well aware of what the high court said in uh, the last Shrems decision, and they've been working on it for years, and they've obviously put a lot of thought and effort to bridging, and there are of course limitations as we know about what the U.S. can do without a amending the Constitution or passing a statute. So I think a lot of us that have been watching this would say they've done a you know phenomenal job of bridging maximally to solve what is in the Schrems decision while balancing against limitations that you have to do. Uh, if I may, and again, this we'll start in reverse order this time since we started with Shannon last time. If I could go, Peter, to you first, do you have a view on, you know, the new redress mechanisms and how it really stands up to some of the requirements and trends and um, any thoughts on, you know, the path here to adequacy decision and then and then defensibility? Yeah, well, on redress with uh, uh, Theodore Christakis, a noted a French expert on, on these issues, and Ken Prop, former State Department lawyer in Brussels on these issues, we've written three articles on redress. Um, and um, the my own view is that the, the new structure built here responds to all the requirements of EU law on redress and that it meets U.S. constitutional requirements. I'll just point out very briefly some of the constitutional constraints that the U.S. was under that people don't always appreciate. And I have three to mention briefly. So the first one is um, to go into federal court and have the traditional federal courts look at something, you have to have standing to sue. American lawyers are familiar with this. And the Supreme Court in recent decisions has been tougher and tougher on some of the privacy-related standing claims. Um, so that we could not find any proposal in Congress legislation that could get the redress into federal court directly. And there has been no published proposal that would get a redress proposal into federal court upon the complaint of a European citizen. Everybody in Europe needs to be able to ask for this request once, you, once the EU is uh, in the system. And, um, and so there's not been a way for Congress to do that. Secondly, there's very, very strict rules about independence under the court's interpretation, the Court of Justice's interpretation of, of the charter, the European charter. And there's been a bunch of US Supreme Court case law within the last several years about what it means to be an independent agency. They struck down the uh, Consumer Products uh, Safety Commission. Uh, and so we go in our articles through the analysis of why this surprising structure exists to have a regulation in the Department of Justice where the attorney general limits his own discretion and creates independence. And in a Supreme Court case called Accardi back a bunch of years ago, the Supreme Court specifically said that could create independence for judicial decisions inside the Department of Justice, but independent. So that's a second constitutional constraint, what it means to be independent under US law. And the third one is this involves Executive Order 12333, which is the president's national security powers to do intelligence and protect the nation when the data is collected outside of the US. And there has never been any significant uh, congressional laws that define how the president uses that national security power. And under the Supreme Court jurisprudence, if a lot of things people might want to do by statute would be in good faith found to be unconstitutional or in doubt of being constitutional by, for instance, the Office of Legal Counsel. And so US lawyers have gotten very used to learning EU law about fundamental rights. So you have to do it this way and you can't do it that way. And we're trying to point out that there's really substantial constraints under US constitutional law so that many of the requests that have been made for changes, I don't believe would be constitutional under US law. And so it's quite remarkable that the Rubik's Cube has been built. So the redress procedure is uh, so solidly meeting both European and US requirements the way it does. I'll stop there. You've covered a lot of the constraints and why in some ways they had to you know, flex around these, Peter. They're, 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 it really is important to cover that. When I go over to Alex, both you and Shannon, you know, the big picture is the, 
the team bridged a lot. They came up with some very elegant, in my view, solutions, and there were limitations under which they had to act. You know, any reactions to the approach that was adopted, Alex and Shannon, and or, you know, you can't really predict whether it's, you know, how a high court is going to rule. That's if we could, a lot of us would be wealthier than we are. Um, so, you know, do you have views on this, you know, once it's once and if it's challenged? Um, I'll go first and then, you know, Shannon obviously can 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 go. Um, the uh, I agree with what Peter has been saying about the redress function. I think it, that, that actually is a very uh, elegant, as you put it, Justin, and, and clear way of trying to bridge the differences between how the U.S. legal system operates and how uh, what, what the language was in the EU uh, in the Schrems II decision. Um, I'll, I'll say one thing also there that, that I think has come under some criticism, which is this notion that um, coming out of the redress process, complainants are going to get the same kind of notification, which is uh, essentially one that can neither confirm nor deny that the claimant's uh, you know, data was uh, actually collected and what happened. And uh, I'll just point out that this is a very common one across uh, all uh, intelligence agencies. I was a huge proponent of transparency when I was in government, um, but you, a fully transparent intelligence service will be fully ineffective. You can't uh, disclose all the secrets that you have in response to anybody filing an individual complaint. So there has to be a way of protecting sources and methods, including whether or not a particular person uh, was the subject of intelligence collection. That doesn't mean that nothing is happening behind the scenes. And I think that's a, uh, a big feature of what uh, of this new intelligence community directive that Peter uh, was talking about and posted or, or you know, sent around a link about. That, that intelligence community directive uh, does, in fact, implement what the executive order has been saying and shows how much process is going on, how much investigation is going on. And uh, behind the scenes, which is subject to oversight and review by the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board. So that's part of what I'm sure Travis and his colleagues will be looking at is how did that investigation function? Did it function in accordance with what the executive order says? Even if the complainant doesn't see all of that, it is happening behind the scenes. There is oversight over that process. And at the end of that process is when the person gets the notification. So the notification is significant because it signals the end of that process. And you see the and then that triggers the ability to go to the Data Protection Review Court, and they will review the factual record created by the Civil Liberties Protection Officer in that investigation and look at other additional materials and request additional information. And at the end of their process, that also is triggered by this notification. So I think, I think it's really um, uh, elegantly done. And as you point out, Justin, it's hard to know how a judge will rule on it. And there's also the necessity and proportionality parts of the executive order, which I think are a significant uh, enhancement, a, a major change, actually, in terms of how the language, uh, the language that we adopted in this executive order versus what we were doing with the Presidential Policy Directive 28. So as Bruno was saying in the last panel, this is a major, uh, you know, major, significant, substantial, pick your word, but it is, uh, it is a heavy lift on the part of the uh, United States government to uh, meet those uh, standards, and I think that they've done it. Um, how the, uh, how the judges will respond is, is hard to predict. Uh, I do think that this concept of essential equivalence is essential. Uh, it's essential equivalence is essential. That, that they have to really focus on, on this cannot be a cookie cutter copy of what you know, they think is required by the charter and, the, and in, in terms of all the details that they might look for if looking at uh, an EU member state. It has to be essentially equivalent, um, which acknowledges the kinds of differences in legal frameworks that Peter was talking about. Our constitution is what it is. Um, and unless they're demanding that we uh, amend our constitution, which I don't think they are, they have to give, uh, they have to give, um, they have to make substantive this idea of essential equivalence. Uh, Alex makes a ton of sense. Why don't we, why don't we, Give Shannon a moment for your reaction. What are your thoughts on the the mechanisms and and like defensibility, Shannon, from your perspective? Yeah, thanks, Justin. So I would agree with Alex that it's a really elegant solution and it's gone a long way to address some of the complaints. I think the thing that I would add is just reading through what 
Max Schrems has had to say about the redress mechanism, I think is going to be one of the key areas of his challenge to the new framework. He said that it doesn't really, he's criticized that it's not really a court, it's just a redress body within the executive branch. He called it um, an odd ombudsman ombudsperson plus and said that it will be a rubber stamp institution with no practical relevance. And while I don't believe that, I think, you know, his voice is pretty loud in the chorus in Europe. And he has stated that it's going to be a core part of his challenge to the new framework. So I think it's important to just put that perspective alongside everything we've been talking about. Yeah, I, I get Can it. I just do a, yeah. a two yeah. finger on that? Yeah. Um, so the ombudsperson in Privacy Shield, and people were negotiating the best they could at that point, did not have binding decision, was not an independent official. Those are two of the absolutely crucial requirements the court has announced. And there is independence and there is binding decisions under the new system. So those to say it's ombudsperson really doesn't show having read the materials I think that have been issued. Yeah, I, I concur there. And I know this was these were not Shannon's um, talking points. This is what Max said and she was reporting them to us. But you know, I would I would also add on that the ombudsperson was a US government employee. Um, you know, these folks cannot be employees of the United States government, in fact, for more than I think two years. I think they have to be two years out of government um, to to do this. So and there the ombudsperson was one person. This is now more people. You're going to have panels of judges that are going to look at this, two, three people looking at it. And then on top of that, the P Club will then have the ability to oversee it and look at whether or not there's been compliance with the decision. To me, that's totally different from the ombudsperson scenario that we were talking about um, before. You know, you know to, to, to go back, though, to where this all goes. Um, you know, we now have the draft advisory uh, decision um, out of the uh, uh, adequacy decision out of the the the, the commission. Um, I'm interested to see whether or not um, the the EDB, EDP uh, B refers this to the CJEU for a, a decision on the front end. I think that could get us, you know, right to 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 the CJEU's views very early on, and not two or three years from now. Um, and I am concerned. Um, it, I'm not concerned that the executive order um, and the you know negotiated framework um, you, you know failed to meet the issues that were raised in the Shrimps decision. I actually think they tailored the uh, the framework to address those issues to the extent that U.S. law can. You heard some of the limitations constitutionally um, that that Peter was just focused on. However. I am concerned that the court might move the goal line. And, and the reason I am concerned about that is that the CJU has been skeptical of European surveillance practices. And there's a whole line of decisions, you know, the LQDN decision, which looked at the French surveillance framework and, um, you know, seemed to come pretty close to saying it was illegal. And that followed a DRI decision and a Tele2 decision in which they said clearly that general and indiscriminate retention of metadata did not meet, you know, was not, uh, was not uh, exceeded the bounds of necessary um, and was not justified. And then there were also decisions on limitations on bulk collection. These are all not really being discussed as much in the Shrimps world, but I am concerned that this now comes up the next time, even if the issues that have been raised in the past were there. So that does give me some skepticism. And I do also worry that if on this third stop after Safe Harbor, after Privacy Shield, and now we find ourselves in the data privacy framework, if it is struck down again, I don't think or I think there will be a real question by industry as to whether or not going down this road a fourth time is even worth it. There becomes a point in which you need a solution. The industry needs a solution that is consistent, that they have confidence in, and that will be around for a while. And you know whether that's SCCs or BCRs, they're going to have to have something that's a little bit more permanent. And so I do think 
I, I, I genuinely wonder, and I, I don't know if the other panelists have, whether the third time of, of failure of this, if it happens, could ultimately undermine any ability to do this in the future. And, and frankly, I, I think it also raises into question whether the United States considers whether it needs to, 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 to more to protect the personal data of US persons when it is going from the United States abroad. And we see, we see the beginning of that policy in the executive order in so far as it gives the attorney general the authority to determine on a nation state by nation state basis whether or not to permit uh, the transfer of US data if the, or, or permit um, uh, the ability of Europe, of, 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 a, of a citizen or a data subject of a nation state to take advantage of the redress uh, op, uh, offered under the executive order if uh, that country doesn't also provide equivalent protections to United States persons data. And so you can see the beginning of thinking about reciprocity on in US policy. And to me, this is the first time I think we've seen anything like this and is likely the mark of the beginning of recognizing um, that this is a commercial issue and it is a trade issue in addition to being about fundamental rights. So if, by the way, if I may, you know, I know I knew this was going to happen. We have so much to cover and we've got about maybe 10 minutes, 12 minutes left. So I've gotten one question out. The one question so far was, hey, what do you think about the executive order? And, and Travis, by the way, I, I think we all understand and, and agree that there's 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 some important policy items you covered in what you said. There's important points in both what Shannon and Alex said and uh, Peter, you obviously set the tone with a lot of the constitutional and legal limitations. Um, I, um, I guess I'll, just so everybody gets a chance to cover a couple of other topics, I think there's, um, there's the defensibility and Travis, you raised again some important issues like, look, if there's a challenge here and it's knocked down, you know, where do we go? I had a couple of quick reactions to, to the points and then I'll throw it out for reactions. One is... You know, the, the adequacy decision, as we all know, um, that would follow this, the, the process, it covers all the means of transfer to the United States from Europe. That's such an important thing because it means SECs become valid. I mean, not, not that they were invalid. I'm not going to say that because, man, we don't want to jinx that. But, you know, everybody was wondering how SEC stood, how BCR stand. You know, there's obviously a potential for California to get adequacy, and that all rests on, you know, this adequacy decision in some way, right? Which is interesting. So I, I understand what you're saying. Will there be a desire to do this again? And I think you almost have to, because if it was struck down again for the same reasons, you could sort of affect all the means of transfer. And that's a bit extreme, you know, given how much is going on between Europe and the United States, for example. Um, another subject that came up, you know, um, in the sessions earlier today is you have a whole slew, you know, thousands of companies that basically certified and have been, they've been committed to doing more than they have to do under US law in order to get the benefit of a transfer. And for now several years, they have not had the benefit of a transfer, which means a lot of small and medium-sized companies have had to put in place SCCs or, or binding corporate rules, even though they're trying to do the right thing and follow the rules, uh, which is just, you know, it, it gives you a reason why, you know, you can see the US and, and EU trying to put in place another framework. Um, so anyway, why, why don't I just, I'll, I'll, I know there's a lot to cover, but maybe I'll pivot over to everybody on the defensibility issue, on the reactions to the panel that we just covered, any other points anybody would like to make before we move to the next subjects that we, we'd identified? And I'll go, you know, Shannon, Alex, Peter, Travis. Sorry, my internet is having some issues, so I'm going to hand over to Travis. All right, I'm happy. I'm happy. I will just note, California is part of the United States. That's not changing, and so to the extent that the you know anyone in California, any entity is operating in California, all the concerns 
about U.S. surveillance laws would seem to still apply, even though there is the CCPA and CPRA. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, Travis. All I was saying is once you get an adequacy decision and these new mm -hmm. protections are in place, then, and we just covered this with Bruno and Alex, then you have the legal basis that California could seek adequacy based on the new CPRA. That's what I was trying to cover. So obviously, yeah. if that's not there, if you don't have adequacy and you don't have the right you know, redress mechanisms and protections from a national security perspective, that's certainly not something California can put in place. So I think it's an important yeah. set of frameworks. And, and I think the role of the P Club would be really critically important in enabling California to seek adequacy you know, in the future. I'm sorry, that's all I was trying to cover with that one. Alex, and then Peter, anything from, from either of you? Yeah, I just wanted to, to piggyback on something that Travis had said about the recent decisions and the trend in the, in the cases in the, in, in the EU, the CJEU regarding data retention and similar topics. The, the, I think there's a positive, the, optim, the optimism I have, with, I share the concern that Travis was mentioning regarding uh, how the court views these issues, but on the positive side, they do distinguish national security from other law enforcement purposes. And the executive order is strictly about national security. So I think that's a distinguishing point. The executive order does put in place a lot of a lot of the kinds of safeguards that the court, both in the European Court of Human Rights and the Court of Justice in the European Union, look for for this kind of thing. Bulk collection is not uh, invalid in Europe. It is has been validated as as a valid as a as a legitimate form of collection for intelligence agencies. So to the extent they're focused on bulk collection. It's not that you can't do it. It's really whether you have the uh, sufficient safeguards around it. So those are the things that I that I think of as a, as positives. And then, of course, you have to bring in the essential equivalence standard. It's not exactly how um, um, it's not exactly the same. It has to be essentially equivalent. And my last point is on a transparency thing. I think for the court's sake, uh, as well as for all mutual understanding, the more transparent we are, the more clear we are about the value of the of the data how these protections work in practice, um, the need for the, this kind of um, activity to protect the nation's security for the US as well as for our partners in Europe. I think the better understanding uh, the court may achieve as to why these tailored protections are the way they are. Peter, I have two Shannon, I wanna come back to you if you're in um, working. So right. Peter, over to you first. Uh, two quick, first of all, section 702 is not a bulk surveillance program. There's continued misinformation in Europe about that. It's based on targeted selectors under a criteria set by the courts. And there was an, the first Snowden article was corrected a week after it was issued. The first Snowden article in 2013 said that there was direct access into the company systems. That was not true. It's not allowed under the law. And people continue to cite the incorrect initial journalism article. Second point is Europe has a, a, a jurisprudential question of how they're going to look at India and China and other very important trading partners of the EU. So the US system, maybe, I don't know what the number is, maybe it's 90 out of 100 or 85 out of 100 if you were grading it, or maybe in my view, it's a 95 or a 98 out of 100. But China flunks. And if, if they're trying to get you know, super specific requirements for trade at all with the United States, with all of these provisions in place, I, I literally don't know how they're jurisprudentially gonna handle China or a country like India that's in between where the US and China is. That's a huge well, problem facing them and they don't have a good legal answer to that if they continue to, to, to say that the US's extraordinary efforts here are not, are not good enough. Well, and if I may for everybody, to, to, do we understand, and all of us work with folks in Europe and you know, obviously know the EDPB members and the European Commission, why are they not at this point shifting some more significant focus on data transfers to China or Russia? I know you put India on the list, so I'm not trying to move that away, but what, I mean, what, what about Russia? They have an EDPB <laughs> statement, which is softer than the EDPB statement to Russia is softer than the EDPB criticisms of the United States. Yeah, so I, I guess I'm, I'm a little lacking in understanding this. Even if you look at some of the major social media platforms, they have data transfers from the United States and from Europe to both Russia and China. I, I, I guess I'm, do you guys have a perspective on this, having, having seen it? Well, I, I, listen, again, 
the, the, the thing that could be troubling for the for European Commission is if we say, if you start tying United States to these other countries, it gets clouded because we understand these are means of transfer to the United States. So let's separate out the United States for a minute. Just looking at Russia or China independent of the United States, why isn't the EDPB, why isn't the European Commission more focused on this in your view? Do you have an, a, a perspective? I think it's a I think it's a great question, Justin, and one that I don't think there's any clear answer to. I also, you know, there's a lot of to Travis's point. Cross border data transfer is a political issue. It's, um, you know, there is a trade issue, and a lot of the um, history of cross border data transfer is built on a series of things that are sort of legal fictions in some ways. And I think companies are left to sort out, okay, well, I can transfer data to certain companies in Canada, Uruguay, Japan, anywhere in Guernsey, Isle of Man, and, and these certain countries, but actually I can't transfer data to the US. So when it comes down to the block and tackle of cross-border data transfer, it's figuring out, okay, what can I actually do and what do I need to do to paper it? That's the question that I get from a very practical perspective every single day, apart from the like political issues and the trade issues that color the in, entire topic. Alex, Peter, Travis. I, I think it's a hugely important question, Justin. I believe, um, I mean, we've, I've heard statements from European officials saying that they are looking into those kinds of transfers. And obviously there's no adequacy finding for those countries right now, but of course that's true of many countries. And, and so, um, and I've heard uh, European officials say that there wouldn't be, you know, uh, an adequacy finding for, for a country like China. Um, uh, I, I, it would be good to see uh, more public statements and more detail about investigations that they're looking into regarding those data transfers. I mean, there is a war going on with, between Russia and Ukraine uh, that, that is threatening a lot of people's uh, livelihoods and lives uh, and killing people. And I, I think that's a very real, that's the kind of very real risk that not, not that privacy is not a real risk, but that's the, that the immediacy of that risk is the one, is the sort of thing that the national security community is very focused on and is exercising its tools and authorities to um, uh, protect the security of Europe as well as of uh, the United States as much as possible. And so that's the utility and value of those tools. And then you have to counterbalance that with the need to protect privacy. But a focus on that kind of risk, I think, is very important. Yeah, and, and listen, I don't want to tie that to this. This is an adequacy decision, which is obviously a different thing than what we're talking about. I can also see in the questions folks are saying, hey, there are some investigations going on with respect to transfers to China or Russia. I guess I don't I don't have insight into that. So maybe there's more going on than I realize, you know. Um, so and you can see oh, there's a there's some links here, which is terrific. Um, maybe one thing just briefly in answer to your question is the following. Why does Europe focus more on the United States? And there's two reasons, I think, just descriptively. First is Snowden released data about US intelligence practices and it shocked the world. And so that was a US thing. And secondly, the biggest platforms, you know, what's called GAFM or whatever before Facebook changed its name, are based in the United States. And so in the lived experience of a typical person in Germany or France, they're using lots and lots of US platforms. And so they have concerns about what happens to their data on those US platforms. That's not crazy. There's evidence in public of US Snowden releases and the lived experience is that it's US that's getting their data. And so just at a practical factual level, not a legal level, at a practical factual level, I think it's not so hard to understand. Yeah, I mean, there's limits to that though, Peter. I mean, some of the most widely used platforms right now are Chinese based. You've probably seen some of the articles out there where there's like a bipartisan call for barring certain ones of these. So, I mean, I, I get, I, I understand, you know, and I understand that this is in the context of an adequacy decision. Um, listen, I knew we would run out of time. The four of you have so much depth on this issue. I would like to be able to, um, I'd like to be able to give each of you a moment. You know, I know there were subjects we didn't get to cover. So um, I'm gonna, uh, if, uh, if I may, I'll go Shannon, um, Alex, Travis, we'll end with Peter again. 
Um, any final thoughts on um, on these issues? And I know there were a couple of points each of you wanted to cover. Feel free to cover it here. And as always, we're, we're deeply appreciative that each of you came. This is a really important issue. And each of you are actually serving and have served a role in ensuring that these international data transfers can occur safely and reliably. And, and we're very grateful for that. So uh, Shannon, um, Alex, Travis, Peter, closing thoughts. Great, thanks. Thanks, Justin. This has been a really rich conversation. I think when it comes down to companies today and what they're thinking through, whether to join the new framework, um, it's a really big question. It's a pretty, you know, if they haven't been part of the privacy shield, it's a fairly heavy lift. It's going to require administrative cost, you know, time to implement all of the new amended principles and to work through the different requirements of the framework. For companies that are already part of the privacy shield, the, the, the question that they're really faced with is whether to actively withdraw, which you're required to do, which comes with a cost and administrative uh, burden as well or whether they were going to uplift to the new amended data privacy framework principles and implement, do all the things that they need to do to, uh, to reach the standard of the new framework, which is an investment of time and resource and it, uh, negotiating potentially agreements with counterparties. And they're looking at that through the lens of, well, is this gonna get struck down in three years time? So it's a really complicated calculus for companies looking at it through the lens of risk and longevity of the different frameworks. And I'm not sure that I would say to anyone right now to stop using the standard contractual clauses or another method of cross-border data transfer, even when the new data privacy framework, when the adequacy decision is, is finalized. So I think that's a lot of the things that you know companies thinking through this issue right now have to look at this question and just think through all of the different you know pros and cons of each of the each of the different options available to them again just from a purely practical standpoint putting aside the politics the commercial issues the policy issues and the sort of art and science of uh, cross border data transfer terrific thank you shannon uh, alex Yes, two things. One is I think the uh, draft uh, adequacy decision is uh, is excellent. It, it's I, I think it's great. It's very well written, and I think it accurately reflect, reflects the U.S. legal framework. So I think that's that's a sign uh, of of how seriously the both teams took uh, this whole process. And secondly, I'll just point out we've been, of course, very focused on the transatlantic issue, but this is a global challenge, as you've alluded to. And as part of the global side of things, the OECD uh, adopted. Uh, and posted today a declaration uh, of common principles in terms of how uh, OECD member countries' governments access personal data held by the private sector for uh, national security and law enforcement purposes. So that's a very important declaration. I think it's a very promising one, showing that countries, like-minded democracies, are focused on these issues, are focused on how do we enhance mutual understanding so that we can build trust in each other's legal frameworks um, uh, going forward, hopefully in a way that enables uh, data to continue to flow, uh, but also in a rights respecting manner. So I think that is a, is a, is a very positive step on the uh, global stage. Alex, you know, I know we wanted to cover OECD work in deeper, um, in a deeper way. We are having a follow-up session on a few of these items here in a couple of weeks. I think this might be a subject we could cover again for the spokes community, if you wouldn't mind. So sure. thank you for highlighting it. I think the OECD working stream is probably one that we should all be paying attention to. Um, Travis. Yep. Justin, first of all, thank you again for the invitation to join this panel. This has been a very interesting and timely um, discussion uh, on the uh, EU-US data privacy framework. Um, as a US, and much of the conversation has focused understandably on cross-border data transfers. But I'd like to return to our homeland at the end and just note that as a United States citizen, I'm very proud of the executive order because of the additional privacy and civil liberty safeguards that will apply to the Act to the signals intelligence activities of the US government. 
these are these changes are substantial, um, and we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that going forward, you know, signals intelligence activities will only be conducted in pursuit of defined national security objectives that they will take into consideration the privacy and civil liberties of all persons and that they will be conducted only when necessary to advance a validated intelligence priority and only to the extent and in a manner proportionate to that priority. Whether or not the CJEU ultimately agrees that the framework is, is adequate, the reality is in the United States, we have seen a substantial advance in the privacy and civil liberty safeguards that are now apply to signals intelligence activities. And, and I believe the administration should be applauded for it because these changes take a lot of time, a lot of energy. Alex, you know, did this. This is hard to do what we're doing. Again, may not be sufficient for Europe, but for, for what we're getting in the US, I'm very proud. And I just want to highlight that all of us are been in the US side are benefiting from this. Travis, I, yeah, I know we, we do appreciate it. It is under recognized. And I think the summary you started with on all the work that's going on on P Club is really um, unbelievable. And, and it's not going on in many other parts of the world. So thank you for all you're doing, Travis. And um, with that, over to Peter. Yeah, I want to end with a little bit of, of a contest of ideas that's happening here. So Within Europe, I'm, I'm currently supervising a couple of dissertations by European data protection scholars. And within Europe, the fundamental rights protections are built into the most important legal documents, the charter, the, the GDPR and, and other documents. And the view is that this is an exercise to build a new framework of protecting fundamental human rights for the digital age. And every time you create an exception, you're weakening fundamental rights, you're undermining fundamental rights. Um, and uh, if there's a gap in protection, well, it's time to fill in that gap. If the US does nine things, but it doesn't do the 10th, we got to fill in the 10th Th because otherwise you're weakening fundamental rights. And then if you disagree with always elevating the number of requirements, you're caving into commercial interests and that's crass and that's not a good reason to undermine rights. So I think that the whole discussion needs ways to frame what, what's being done here in a convincing and positive light, because to me it is convincing and positive that we're building a whole series of institutions and checks and balances to match the digital age, including the P club, including oversight and independence and all these things. And there's a, there's a convincing world of interconnecting um, balance of power, uh, 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 create structures that actually work and somehow show how that's the right way to proceed not to undermine rights, but to actually make them be able to, to exist in, in people's lives. And unless we have a positive story other than crass commercialism, it's gonna be very hard to convince the court um, to, uh, to approve almost anything that comes from outside of the EU. Yeah, Peter, I mean, that is, that's a great point. And you know, a lot of the ways that I remember this came up is there's so many human rights that are actually vindicated by the use of technology and so many human rights and safety issues that are actually protected by the ability to share data. And so many startups and smaller companies and mom and pop organizations that are actually transferring data to make things better. And I think that voice has to be heard if this is gonna be a meaningful conversation. Um, and, uh, but I think it's an important point. Uh,